Ready, fire, aim. When ready, huh? <laughs> Earl, it's good to welcome you back to Dallas-Fort Worth. We talked when you were here for the Thin Blue Line, and of course, with the great Dallas connection that that story had. But uh, now you're uh, talking, or you're here to talk about your new film, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. I love the title. <laughs> what uh, What is the strange significant... title? <laughs> what is uh, you're you're swiveling? Uh, what is the um, uh, what is the meaning, or what was your idea behind calling it fast, cheap, and out of control? It's a line that comes from one of the four characters in the movie. Uh, there's four strange occupations, a topiary gardener, uh, a mole rat photographer, a lion tamer, and a robot scientist um, who teaches at MIT. Uh, it was a paper a proposal that he had written, his bid for the Martian rover contract from NASA. Uh, and his idea was to send thousands of little tiny robots scurrying around on Mars rather than having one big rover. And the title of this proposal was Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. Uh, he used the phrase, and I thought, this is a great title for my movie. I liked it the, the minute I heard it. Which one did you start working on first, or make contact with first? All four of them were done fairly quickly. I had known the lion tamer for years. I had been fascinated with lion taming. Uh, and this guy was one of the last lion tamers in the old-fashioned school of lion taming. This is a guy with a whip, a chair, and a pistol. Um, and I filmed him and his lions down in Florida at the summer home of the Clyde Beatty Cold Brothers Circus. So he was the first of the guys. Um, then I found my topiary gardener, uh, I found my mole rat photographer, and last of all I found the robot scientist in my backyard. I live in Boston, he teaches at MIT, his office was a 10 minute walk from my office. I went to see him and knew I had to put him in this movie. This is a movie about life, about people's obsession with creating different kinds of life, controlling different kinds of life. Um, and I went up to his lab, his robot lab at MIT, and it's not as though he has one or two robots. Uh, he had dozens of different kinds of robots, uh, each with names, uh, almost like they were children. Um, and each time I go up there, he has produced two or three more robots. In fact, now he has a humanoid, a humanoid robot called Cog that he's raising uh, as a child. So there you go. <laughs> I found some truly interesting characters this time around. The topiary gardener just fascinated me. First of all, where is that garden? outside of Newport, Rhode Island, again uh, in the Boston area, about an hour drive from where I live. Um, I'd always wanted to film a topiary garden, film a topiary gardener. This is long before Edward Scissorhands. And then I found out not only is this a garden, but it's a circus menagerie out of hedge. These are wild animal topiaries, elephants, giraffes, camels, lions, tigers, bears. Uh, when I heard about it, I knew I had to go down there and I met the gardener, who I think is just wonderful, wonderful guy. And I put him in his garden in Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control. He's a, a great character, a great guy. He surely doesn't do all of that work himself, does he? For many, many years he did. He, he celebrates his 88th birthday uh, this year. And for many years, this garden was his true love. Um, it's one of my f favorite lines in the movie. He talks about how it took him 15 years to make the bear, to make this topiary animal. Um, to me, he's the, 
artist, uh, making things that are a little bit crazy, maybe even absurd, but with complete love and with complete devotion. Is that garden open to the public? Yes. You can go and see it. And it's who owns it? Um, the Newport Preservation Society manages a lot of the older estates in the Newport area, and this is one of them. I know Newport, and I have been there and done the historical tour and all, but I did not know about the, uh, the garden. I should love to see that. Well, next time, ask to see Green Animals. That's the name of the place. All right. And it's truly a beautiful garden. I think a one-of-a-kind garden. There's nothing quite like it anywhere else in the world. Has to be. Has to be. Just extraordinary. Okay. Um, one of the uh, stories that I found uh, fascinating about the lion tamer, uh, a wristwatch nearly cost him his life, didn't it? Well, he lives in a world. His world is one where you have to keep your wits about you. Um, he tells us what goes on in a lion's mind when he's facing it in the cage. Um, he talks about his nightmares, the nightmare of suddenly finding a lion with its paws on his neck, chewing on his head. These are his own words. So it's a battle of wits the way he sees it, him against the lions in his cage. And one moment of inattention, one mistake, uh, and he's out of control. He's ditter. But the, the wristwatch? The wristwatch nearly did him in. Um, he had worn a wristwatch into the cage, and one of his lions caught a paw on the expansion band, and uh, this was nearly the end of him. And it just drew him into the lion then, yes. where he was attacked. I, I, I think the stories that he tells about being in the cage with his lions are really remarkable. Um, I can't quite say that Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control is the movie to go and see if you want to be a lion tamer, but it certainly can tell you a lot about what goes inside a lion tamer's head when he's inside the cage with his wild animals. This is a movie very much about how people see the world, how they experience the world. Uh, there may be strange occupations on the face of it, but I think there's something that any one of us could identify with here. I must confess to you, I didn't even know what a mole rat was. Well, am, am I just uneducated, or <laughs> are they rare? They're a fairly recent discovery, the South African naked mole rat. Uh, my mole rat enthusiast in the movie talks about his fantasy as a child, uh, this 1950s science fiction fantasy of finding insect people people that really live like insects in colonies, like termites, bees, or wasps. And then they found this creature, the naked mole rat, uh, in Africa. Uh, the first time I read about them was in the New York Times, and they were described as the mammal that breaks all the rules. Um, cold-blooded, mammals are not supposed to be cold-blooded. Living in colonies like insects, well, mammals are not supposed to live that way. Um, yet, here they are, and he even imagines that they may be the mammals of the future. <laughs> <laughs> this may be the fate of all of us, living in tunnels underground. <laughs> Shouldn't laugh, I tell you, you know, maybe 30 years ago there are things that we thought would, were far out and we're laughing about which have come to pass. Well, I remember reading as a child in H.G. Wells' Time Machine of the Morlocks, these creatures that live in tunnels underground. Well, here is some crazy science fiction fantasy come to life, the naked mole rat. Were all of these people enthusiastic about your doing the film of them? F fortunately, yes. Uh, all of these people uh, were delighted to be in the movie. They've all seen the movie with audiences that's premiered in New York City at Lincoln Center, and they were there for the premiere. And it was a wonderful moment. Uh, I look at the movie in, among the many things that 
uh, this movie is, is it's certainly a celebration of these four, four characters. I'm very fond of each one of them. Uh, and I hope that the movie somehow captures them and what they do and who they are. Well, that it does. It did for me. It is fascinating because, uh, well, I knew about topiary gardens, but mole rats I knew from nothing. The, the robot man, I mean, incredible creations he has there. And um, certainly the lion tamer, I learned things that I didn't know before, <laughs> maybe don't want to know about anymore. But uh, all of it, just fascinating there, just fascinating. Well, thank you very much. Now, do you have a current project you're working on? Oh, I always have movies. Uh, someone once told me I should do a film called The Files of Errol Morris because I have so much material still waiting to get on film. And so I hope there'll be another film ready next year. Uh, some more nonfiction, some fiction, and a television series I'm working on, uh, my nonfiction version of The Twilight Zone, which I hope will be on television sometime next year as well. So I'm trying to, trying to keep busy. Well, you're the guy who can do it. <laughs> Thank you, Earl, so Thank much. Thank you very, very much. My pleasure. It's nice to see you again, Thanks. and I appreciate I just, it. Just stay where you are okay, for some yes. editing. Talk about whatever you want to talk about. As long as okay. you don't well, swivel. Don't okay, worry. I won't swivel. I'll, <laughs> don't try to, I'll try to be good. <laughs> and I thought um, also, uh, and I read all the background on um, the uh, having the people talk to the camera. If you want to address that a little bit, you may. Sure. <clears throat> Just, um, it, it's a tele teleprompter uh, concept, actually. Basically, yes, but I've never seen him used that way. I just have never seen it done. It's two teleprompters, basically. It's two cameras, two prompters. Um, one camera, say, is on you. Uh, another camera is on me. I could be in a different room. And the prompters are cross-connected. Simple as that. The uh, feed from camera A goes to teleprompter B. The feed from teleprompter B goes to camera A. And we're looking at each other's live video images, basically facing each other. And we're also looking, it's like the camera lens is between you and me. Uh-huh. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. And you just put all that together yourself. Yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's produced actually remarkable stuff. I, I like what it's done. I'm using it for this TV series. It's sort of at the heart of this. It's first-person storytelling. It's one guy really telling a story, uh, a, a story to an audience. Um, and looking directly at them, just as you looking into a prompter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> Did you consider any more than just the four people you ended up with? Not really, no. I, I had considered making a variety of different movies, but I thought that five or six was too many and three too little. And I like, I like that change from the past to the future in the movie, from this gar Garden of Eden to this really futuristic nightmare that the robot guy talks about. So yeah, I thought it, I thought it had a kind of odd balance to it, this, the four stories. Yes, I thought the, um, the way they were interwoven was really interesting. I thought oh, what well, you did you. there. Yeah, I really liked that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I did. Okay, Roy, do you think we're okay? Yes, ma'am. All right.